Good morning. Welcome to the 2011 Singularity Summit. My name is Nathan LeBenz. I'll be your master of ceremonies for the next two days. For those who are new to the concept of a singularity, I thought it made sense to give a one-minute uh, background on what this is all about. The singularity is often defined as the appearance of smarter-than-human intelligence. Now, predictions about how and when this will happen vary substantially. Some expect a powerful artificial intelligence to emerge suddenly, and others expect the status quo to give way more gradually due to brain-computer interfaces, biological augmentation of the brain, genetic engineering, or even brain emulation. But despite the differences in prediction, there is a general agreement among forward-looking people that as our computational power grows and our biological insights improve, that we will one way or another produce a smarter-than-human mind and that affairs as we know them will be drastically changed. Of course, the nature of a smarter-than-human mind is very difficult to predict or to model, and there's been much debate about whether the singularity will bring, will bring positive or negative change. Some expect a utopia, but others fear disaster. The Singularity Institute seeks to bring rational analysis and strategy to the challenges of understanding and safely approaching the era of smarter-than-human intelligence. And this event, our annual Singularity Summit, brings together scientists, philosophers, and other leading thinkers to explore these issues. Over the next two days, you will hear from inventors, doctors, physicists, economists, and entrepreneurs who have shaped our world. They are here because they care and think deeply about the future. We hope that you enjoy their talks, that you can take advantage of this wonderful networking event, and that you will leave with a sense for the great opportunity and the tremendous stakes that we all share as the singularity comes into focus. I've got a few announcements before we get started. First of all, because we're getting a little, little bit of a late start, the breaks will be shorter. So we're going to go down to about 15 minutes on the breaks. The schedule on the website will be updated. So for those of you checking it mobily, it should be up to date very shortly. For press, there is an updated press schedule that's on the door of the press room. You should know where that is. The schedule is there. If it changes, it will be updated there as well. Please take a moment to turn off your cell phones, or at least please put them on silent. And note that all of the speakers have time budgeted for Q&A. So we're going to have mic runners who will bring you the mic to where you are. So raise your hand when Q&A time comes. No speeches, please, or we'll have to cut you off. So without further ado, our first speaker is Ray Kurzweil. Ray has been described as a restless genius and the ultimate thinking machine. He's been called the rightful heir to Thomas Edison and named one of 16 revolutionaries who made America. His long career as an inventor has produced many firsts in pattern recognition. At 17, he built a computer that could compose music. Later, he developed the first text recognition technology capable of reading any font, and also the first commercially marketed large vocabulary speech recognition product. Ray has won the National Medal of Technology, has received 19 honorary doctorates, and has been honored by three US presidents. His latest book, The Singularity is Near, was a New York Times bestseller and has been number one on Amazon in both the science and philosophy categories. Ray will describe how exponential progress in the reverse engineering of the human brain is making it possible to build biologically inspired systems that can recognize and predict patterns and master vast bodies of knowledge. Please welcome, to kick off the 2011 Singularity Summit, Ray Kurzweil. Well, it's great to see all of you, and it's great to see how this summit has evolved since 2006. Uh, like a lot of things, it started with the germ of a little idea that, hey, let's have a meeting. We can talk about these ideas. It was after my book came out, uh, and this summit has grown, uh, ha as has interest in the idea of the singularity, as has evidence that the underlying information technologies are continuing to progress exponentially, and we can quantify that, and we've been tracking it, and I'll talk more about that. But I think the visceral appreciation of the public has grown along with that as we have much more uh, obvious 
demonstrations that technology is moving. Almost everybody recognizes that now because it's affecting everybody's lives. The level of confidence in the AI field reflects that. I remember after my book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, came out, we had a conference at Stanford, uh, and we took a poll with people raising their hands <coughs> as to when people thought uh, computers that could pass the Turing test would, would come around. The consensus of AI experts at that time was about 200 years. Then in 2006, there was a conference at Dartmouth, AI 50, on the 50th anniversary of the 1956 conference at Dartmouth that gave artificial intelligence its name. Uh, then our technology had evolved where we had actual audience response devices, and the same question was asked. And the consensus was somewhere between 25 and 50 years. 25 and 50 years both got a substantial number of responses. It was like 30% each. Uh, recently, there have been polls taken, and uh, the consensus is moving closer to 25 years. Uh, I've stuck with 2029, which is now a little bit less than 25 years, but uh, the consensus is coalescing towards a fairly near future based on a recognition that progress is exponential. And we see sort of viscerally impressive demonstrations of that. I think Watson was very significant. A lot of what's been written about Watson isn't very insightful. A lot of the observers know nothing about Watson other than its software running on a computer, and then they sort of bring out uh, John Searle's old argument why software can never really know anything. I actually took John Searle's, one of his key essays uh, on his Chinese room argument to demonstrate why software can ever actually understand anything, let alone be conscious. And I just substituted manipulating symbols uh, for the words, well, for that I substituted manipulate neurotransmitter concentrations and interneuronal connections. It's a mouthful, but I stuck that in whenever he said manipulate symbols. And you get a very convincing demonstration that the human brain can't possibly know anything <laughs> or understand anything <laughs> or be conscious. And actually that makes sense because we look at a neuron, we see a machine, just as we see machines all throughout biology, and we can understand that machine. It has a certain complexity, but it has certain principles of operation. I'll talk more about that in a moment. And so you have all these different machines. Uh, if you have a large number of machines, you still have a machine. How can that possibly know anything or understand anything? Well, it is an emergent property. Consciousness remains a, a, a difficult subject because, in my view, we really can't measure it. It's not scientifically demonstrable. You can't build a machine where you slide an entity in and a green light goes on. Okay, this one's conscious. No, this one isn't. Without building in some bi uh, philosophical assumptions. So John Searle would build in the, m the assumption that it has to squirt biological neurotransmitters, otherwise it's not conscious. <coughs> Dan Dennett would have a more sophisticated uh, idea that it doesn't matter what the substrate is, but the entity has to have a model of its own thinking, and if it does that, then it's conscious. That's a little closer to my view. But these are all different assumptions. They're leaps of faith. Uh, very often you, you will run across, or I run across, articles that purport to tell you the true basis. We have finally discovered it for consciousness, like Hameroff's recent article, The True Basis of Consciousness. And it talks about uh, cellular computing uh, going on in the uh, tubules of the brain. And it looks a lot like a scientific article because it's filled with scientific observations and formulas about the tubules and how they're capable of doing cellular computing. And buried in the middle of that article is, we think this is the basis of consciousness. And so I'm thinking, whoa, this is a real leap of faith. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, I just think we should recognize leaps of faith for what they are. And uh, I'm writing a book now, How the Mind Works and How to Build One, and talk about this issue. And I refer to a mind rather than a brain, because a, bra a mind is a brain that's conscious, so it brings in this philosophical issue. And my conclusion is that you've got to have faith. 
In other words, we couldn't get up in the morning without some notion of who and what is conscious and where our consciousness comes from. It's actually a very elusive subject. Even the, even the question of what I'm conscious of. I mean, I came over this morning from a hotel. <coughs> How much do I remember of that voyage over here? I remember that I made the voyage. At least I can logically deduce that I must have made the voyage. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, what do I remember about it? Almost nothing. Does that mean I wasn't conscious? We do associate memory with consciousness. That's why we think we're not conscious e during anesthesia, because we wake up and we don't remember anything, so we assume we weren't conscious. But that's actually not proof at all. Uh, I don't remember this trip over here, or very many details about it. Does that mean I wasn't conscious? Uh, it's actually a good question. I'm not, I'm not sure of the answer. So, there continue to be uh, debates, which is something that we encourage at uh, venues like this, Singularity Summit. In fact, think of good questions for me or the other speakers, uh, particularly in terms of point, counterpoint. Uh, in terms of talking and thinking about the singularity, there's no one uh, path in terms of the right way to think about <coughs> these things. I think the underlying observation is the ongoing exponential growth of information technology, but where that will lead us, and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, what the dangers are, that clearly are, is intertwined promise and peril, uh, is open to debate, and I think the only way to get better insight is to have those debates. Uh, last night at the reception, I was asked several times what I thought of Paul Allen's article, The Singularity Isn't Near. So, uh, so in the spirit of point-counterpoint and, and uh, good debate about these issues, I thought I would comment on that. Um, it's typical of a lot of uh, commentary on these issues that Mr. Allen brings in sort of what I would call de novo arguments about the singularity, uh, not really having familiarized himself with the literature. I mean, he alludes to my book, The Singularity is Near, uh, in the title by calling his article The Singularity Isn't Near, but acknowledges in the article that he hasn't read the book. And <laughs> the only citation is to an essay I wrote, The Law of Accelerating Returns, in 2001, five years before the book came out. And while I stand by that essay, it's really not uh, a statement about why the singularity is near. The reason I wrote that book was to respond to just the kinds of criticisms that Paul Allen makes uh, that had come out in response to The Age of Spiritual Machines, which came out in 99. So there were about a dozen different threads of criticism. I uh, alluded to one, John Searle's Chinese Room argument about consciousness. Uh, there are some that Moore's Law is going to come to an end. Uh, exponentials can't go on forever. That's actually one that Paul Allen makes. And <coughs> decided I would write an essay in response to these criticisms. That essay became a book, uh, The Singularity is Near. So that's what, why that book is here. Uh, so it, w it would be good if he actually had rec It's very clear he hasn't uh, read the book because he doesn't uh, allude to any of these arguments in his essay. And then he says what he actually read was this essay, The Law of Accelerating Returns, which is not quite a Cliff Notes version of the book since it was written five years earlier. But there are a couple of observations, more substantively, there are a couple of observations that bear a response to. One is that the Law of Accelerating Returns, which says that information technology, the basic measures of it grow exponentially, is not a physical law. So therefore, it's to be dismissed. I would point out that almost every scientific law is not a physical law, and it's based on emergent properties of some scientific observations at a deeper level. Even the law of gravity is not a directly a physical law. It's based on the interactions of individual particles, and in the aggregate, you, you get the law of gravity about large bodies. In fact, if you take very tiny objects at, at the level of particles, they may or may not follow the law of gravity. It's because they're subject to quantum mechanics and there's a probabilistic 
uh, irreducible uh, indeterminacy to quantum mechanics. So it may or may not exhibit gravity at that very small level. Now you have a large, if you have maybe 10 particles, then you start getting probability effects and it's pretty likely that it will show uh, the law of gravity, but it's still possible it won't. It's conceivable that even a large body like the moon and the earth will not follow the laws of gravity because those are collections of large particles, but the, if you work out the math, the probability of that happening is one in a trillion, 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 so it never actually happens. But it's basically an emergent uh, property of physical laws at a deeper level. A very good example is the laws of thermodynamics. Those are considered laws. But if you look at the mathematics of thermodynamics, it has as a basic assumption that each particle follows a random walk. So I can't tell by definition where this particle will be 10 seconds from now. It's random. But the overall properties of the gas are highly predictable to a very high degree of precision according to the laws of thermodynamics based on the mathematics of large numbers of statistics. And again, it's actually conceivable that entropy won't increase in a gas, but if the gas is, has enough particles, the probability of that is vanishingly small. It's a statistical property, but an overwhelming one, such that it's called a law. It's the same thing with the law of accelerating returns. Uh, his argument against it is that specific projects may not work out. Well, that's exactly right. It's just like a particular particle may not be in a particular position. Any one project uh, is unpredictable. The overall, the law of accelerating returns has to do with the emergent properties of a large number of, of projects. Uh, we have millions of people working on computation. Uh, any one project is unpredictable. The overall results are remarkably predictable. Now, if, if there were six people in the world working on computation, it actually would not be very predictable. It's because it's a large, self-organizing, dynamic, chaotic, randomly interacting system that follows an evolutionary path that it has predictable properties. And I work out the mathematics of this, and, but more importantly is the empirical evidence, which takes a whole book to present, and we've continued this research. I have a team of 10 people that continue to gather this data, and it, if you, if you look at the underlying properties, like the power of computation per constant dollar, instructions per second per dollar, that's the classic example, but it's not the only one, because there are hundreds of measures like this. The number of bits we send wirelessly around the world, the number of bits on the internet, the number of nodes on the internet, the number of base pairs of DNA we're sequencing, the number of megabytes of data we're downloading about the brain. I mean, there's many fundamental measures that follow these exquisitely smooth exponential trajectories. The empirical evidence is really the most important. Uh, and that's really what I present in the singularity this near. He then talks about how, what he calls the barriers to complexity, that the brain is so vastly complex. There's all these trillions of connections and each one has been shaped by evolution to do a very specific thing and it's very delicate. Uh, and we don't really understand it, and we make certain assumptions, they turn out to be wrong. There's actually two, two different ideas there. One is that scientists, th there's something, and I, and I talk about this in the book, uh, called the scientist pessimism, or the engineer's pessimism, because they're dealing with a specific issue, and they don't know the solution to it, otherwise it wouldn't be an issue, and then you talk about how we're going to jump to something that's a thousand times greater and, and their mind boggles. They're focused on this one issue and they, they hope that they can get it, but then to talk about how we're going to just sweep past that and, and do 20 you know, more generations of problem solving just seems overwhelming. And you, so you talk to these experts in a particular field, uh, they will be pessimistic. Uh, I just had experience last week uh, gave a talk for a company that uh, was a pioneer in advancing semiconductors and they've, they've been around for 30 years so they're telling uh, their first project uh, features in semiconductors were 10,000 micron, uh, 10,000 nanometers, that's 10 microns. And the holy grail was maybe we could actually get below a micron. But peop that was very controversial because they were trying to get from 10,000 nanometers to 5,000 
and the scientists were sure they could do it. Of course, if they could do it, they'd be doing it. So they didn't know the answers. And then you talk about, well, maybe we can actually get below a micron. And people had various theses, well, it, it's impossible. The thermal effects will kill it. Uh, you'll get too many stray electrons. If you have features that narrow below a micron, it'll never happen. Uh, well, today we are at 32 nanometers compared to 10,000 back then. 16 is on the drawing board. And again, we hear, well, there's thermal effects and it's going to be probabilistic effects of stray electrons. And uh, the, there is an inherent engineer's pessimism when it comes to looking at the broad scope of, of the trajectory of progress in these fields. It's actually something you need to study specifically. People who are actually trying to solve these individual problems aren't necessarily the best people to ask about the broad sweep of, of technological progress. You have to study that separately. Uh, we are always trying to progress exponentially, and we can measure that in information technology. We have certain capabilities and we have certain tools, and that enables us to take the next step. I mean, fundamentally, that's why technology progresses at an exponential pace. And we're seeing the same thing now in brain science. It's all progressing at an exponential pace. I'll talk more about that. Uh, and we are gaining the fundamental theories about how this, this overall system works, which brings up another key point, which is there aren't trillions of, s of separately evolving mechanisms in the brain. This was another uh, common uh, misperception. I, had a, uh, I was going to have an on-stage debate, which I had with a gentleman, John Horgan, who wrote an article about why we could never reverse engineer the brain, because it would take trillions of lines of code to describe these hundred trillion connections in the brain, and each one is very precise, and he showed pictures of the complexity of the neocortex and said, we'll never be able to uh, understand this. And so one of my responses is, where are these, where's this trillion lines of code? I mean, the design of the brain is in the genome. The genome has four billion rungs, it's about 800 million bytes of information, but it's replete with redundancies. One sequence called ALU is repeated 300,000 times, and there's a lot of examples like that. So in singularities, yeah, I do the math and show that with lossless compression, you can compress the genome to about 50 million bytes. Half of that describes the brain, 25 million bytes. It's less than a million lines of code. That's not simple, but it's a level of complexity we can manage, and we have software systems that are much more complex than that already. And to the complaint that software is, n is not scaling up exponentially with hardware, that's not the case. I, I show many measures of that, of complexity of software, and also performance of software. There was a recent study done by the Scientific Advisory Board to President Obama that looked specifically at this question of hardware versus software progress and decided over the last 10 years we've made a thousand-fold increase in hardware progress per unit currency and a 16,000-fold increase in the ability of software to, s to solve certain standard engineering problems for a total of 16 million to one because uh, they're independent. Uh, so we are making progress in software uh, and we can see that in, in these sort of viscerally impressive uh, demonstrations like Watson or the Google cars which have driven 140,000 miles uh, through the cities and towns of California without human drivers. So how is it then that 25 million bytes, which by the way most of which uh, describes the biology, biological mechanisms of these neurons which do not pertain necessarily to their information handling processes. The information handling is even simpler than that. Not simple, but it's a, it's, it is a level of complexity we can handle. How is that possible when there's 100 trillion connections? Well, that's pretty obvious. There's a lot of repetition in the brain, just as there is in the genome. Those are not the same repetition. There's a complicated translation of the genome to the brain because it creates proteins, and the proteins interact to create these mechanisms. But we see massive repetition. There is a module, for example, in the cerebral cortex. It's an important part of the brain. It's where we do our thinking. And it's repeated a billion times. And there's a little mechanism 
So one of these mechanisms, or actually more than one, several I, I, ha I have trained to recognize the crossbar in a capital A. So as I look around, and uh, I don't see any capital A's. So none of them are firing at the moment. Oh, there's one. Okay. So it happily fired. Aha! Crossbar. And it sends up a signal to a higher level. Uh, and there that, uh, that module gets signals in. Okay, there's a connection from the north central southeast point, And aha, capital A. And then it, it goes up to a higher level. And at, at a higher level, it might say, aha, the word apple. In another part of the neocortex, I'm getting visual recognition of objects. And it might uh, fire and say, aha, an apple. And in another part, which processes auditory information, it's getting information about phonemes and formants and vowels, and goes, aha, someone just said apple. At a very high level, uh, there's modules that uh, trigger on more complicated phenomena, like, that's funny, or that's ironic, or she's pretty. And you probably think that those are much more complicated than the ones down here at the, the fundamental at the lower level, they're actually the same, but they're at a higher level in this conceptual hierarchy. And the fact that the cortex is organized in this hierarchical fashion is why we can think in hierarchies, and that was an evolutionary advantage because the natural world is organized in hierarchies, so it helps us to understand it. And, but the description of these modules actually only occurs once in the genome, it's not repeated a billion times. It doesn't need to be. There's then other information as to how they're wired. We actually have a very good understanding and description of how that module works. And there have been attempts to, to simulate it functionally. Another misconception in the article is that I'm advocating we do just do sort of uh, simulation at the biological level and not understand the brain. And then somehow we will get intelligence from that. I think the whole point of reverse engineering the brain is to understand the principles of operation and then use these principles and leverage them using our engineering tools to create systems that have greater capabilities. Uh, what we don't fully understand yet is the wiring, but we do actually understand the brain is very limited in its ability to wire them because it actually has physical wires, which are the axons of the neurons. And you have this whole layer of the neocortex, which has a mass of these of these connections between these different modules. Uh, so it's limited as to which, as to how these connections between the different conceptual layers can be wired. Uh, clearly, if we si simulate this in a computer, we wouldn't organize it that way. We would allow a much more flexible hierarchy to occur. And we are already translating these conceptual insights uh, into biologically inspired paradigms. Now, Watson, for example, is not by any means a sort of unthinking simulation of the brain. But these biologically inspired paradigms have seeped into uh, Watson. Uh, IBM's press releases about this have been uh, processed too many times by their public relations department. And there's not much insight as to actually how Watson works. You can find the technical articles, people say, well, it's just probabilistic. It's just combining these different things. Statistically, uh, different insights into language. And it has to do with word sequences. And so there's no real understanding. That's actually not exactly how it works. There's a statistical uh, back end where hundreds of different modules, which are organized completely differently, come in. And based on the statistical experience with those modules, uh, are finally resolved to give an answer. That's very much how the brain works. Because at these higher conceptual levels, we have competing hypotheses. If there's ambiguity in language, and language is full of ambiguity, and that's why language is difficult, uh, we have these different probabilistic mechanisms. Well, it could mean this, it could mean that, maybe this word is this. And we try out these different uh, assumptions. And one seems more likely than the other, and we go with that. It's the same kind of probabilistic resolution of ambiguity that takes place in the brain. How these hundreds of modules work is actually quite varied. And so people write, well, it has no real understanding of language. That's not true. There's no way that Watson could, uh, could answer these uh, Jeopardy queries if it had no understanding of language. It is understanding some fairly subtle language, including puns 
and similes and metaphors. And it's not just the Jeopardy query that it's able to uh, disambiguate. It got its knowledge by reading natural language documents. The fact that it then knows that there's some queen in Norway in the 15th century with blonde hair was not hand-coded by the scientists. It got that by reading Wikipedia and other encyclopedias. That's the exciting thing about Watson. It got the knowledge the same way you and I would. Uh, and it brings up an interesting observation about language. One criticism of Watson is correct, which is it doesn't have a human level of command of language. Its, its level of command is below humans. If we were at human levels, you know, we'd be at the Turing test now. But it's able to take a level of understanding that is nonetheless cogent and apply it to a vast amount of material and remember that all with perfect recall. And so it's taking a natural strength of computers and then applying it with a human-like language ability, not yet at human levels, but it's a very powerful combination. So with a lower than human level of understanding, it was able to get a higher score than the two best Jeopardy players in the world put together uh, because of this power. I mean, you and I could read Wikipedia. Uh, it's actually feasible. Take a long time. By the time we finished it, we wouldn't remember anything of the beginning of what we read, and uh, let alone be able in three seconds to come up you know, with that particular queen in Norway. Uh, it's a very impressive combination. When computers really are at human levels, which I uh, still maintain will be around 2029, It'll be able to read billions of pages on the web and remember it all and command that. Uh, and of course, it's, it's not, in my view, not an alien invasion of these intelligent machines to compete with us. Uh, it's, we create these machines to extend our reach. Think about how much smarter we are right now with our tools. And this, you know, here, which, as I've pointed out many times, is a billion times more powerful per dollar than the computer I used when, with when I was a student. Uh, does make me smarter. And it's not just this phone. I mean, it connects to the whole cloud of computing. The cloud includes Google and just ability to, you know, look up, have access to all of human knowledge, really well organized, makes us smarter. There's no question that that's true. I've been managing work groups for 45 years, and I can have now a team of three or four people for a few months accomplish what used to take 100 people years to do. Uh, and interestingly, we don't factor that into our economic statistics. You know, an hour of human labor is still an hour, j despite the fact that we can now accomplish a hundred times as much. Or a dollar of computation or communication or biological technologies today counts as a dollar of economic activity. If I did that in 1980 and spent or produced a dollar of computation, communication, biological technologies, it counted as a dollar. Yet today, for that dollar, I can create a billion dollars of computation or communication or information tech, any kind of information technology circa 1980. And that's completely factored out of these economic statistics. And you might say, okay, it's true, this sort of strange area, these little devices we carry around doesn't pertain to most things. I think one of the important messages is that uh, it ultimately will affect everything we care about. Our biology, health and medicine, has now become an information technology. That was not the case, uh, you know, even 10 years ago, until we had the basic software of life with the Genome Project. Um, medicine was hit or miss. It was still useful. We went from a life expectancy of 37 200 years ago to pushing 80 today, but uh, we basically had no information model of how biology works, and it is inherently an information process. You know, we now have the means of actually changing this outdated software. RNA interference can turn genes off, new forms of gene therapy can add new genes. We can reprogram our cells to have different properties. I can take my skin cells, add four genes, basically change its software and turn it into a equivalent of an embryonic stem cell called an induced pluripotent cell, IPC. Uh, and the ethicists who are opposed to embryonic stem cell research support this because there's no embryos involved. And anyway, if you want a new liver, you'd like it to have your DNA, not the DNA of some other embryo. And there are projects to recreate uh, or rejuvenate literally every organ in the body. And people are doing this already. 
They're doing everything from natural breast enhancements with stem cells to rejuvenating hearts that have been damaged through heart attacks. And uh, we are at least experimentally regrowing organs like the kidney and bladder. Uh, and we're basically reprogramming biology. And how about physical things? So today, today if I want to send you a music album, a movie, or a book, I can send you an email attachment. Five years ago, I'd send you a FedEx package. Uh, I can also send you a violin as an email attachment. If you happen to have a three-dimensional printer, uh, you can print out that violin. I'll show you that in a, in a minute. Um, and this is emerging uh, industry of three-dimensional printing, uh, wh which uses a wide variety of materials. And the scale right now is in microns, very reminiscent to where semiconductors were uh, a couple of decades ago, as I mentioned. But the scale is improving at a rate of 103D volume per decade. It will be nanotechnology uh, in about 20 years. And the way we will get there is actually borrowing the machines of biology. Biology is full of little machines. Uh, for example, the ribosome, which takes a tape, it's called an RNA molecule, reads the data off it, and then assembles a linear sequence of amino acids. Another little machine called a chaperone takes that string of amino acids and folds it up into a predictable three-dimensional shape called a protein. Uh, other little machines gather the amino acids in the environment. Uh, biology is made up of these machines. We can re basically change these machines reprogram them to create physical objects that go beyond biology. That's how we will create these three-dimensional printers. Uh, today, these printers are somewhat expensive. Uh, remember, paper printers were somewhat expensive 15 years ago. Today, they're very inexpensive, and they're much better. The same thing's going to happen with these three-dimensional printers. It's going to revolutionize manufacturing. This is how we're going to manufacture most products. Uh, biological products. Uh, will take a little bit longer, but as the scale gets finer and finer, more and more products will be subject to three-dimensional printing. So physical things will become information as well. So with that introduction, I'll just show you very quickly a few examples. Uh, this is what I wanted to cover today. Any questions on any of this? Uh, I'll go a little more slowly, but I, I covered a lot of this. So I'll skip over it. But let me show you a few things. Um, so Cooper's Law, we had Martin Cooper speak actually at Singularity University, which is a counterpart to Singularity Institute here. It's a university we have in Silicon Valley, backed by Google and NASA. Uh, and Cooper's Law, another example of accelerating returns, these are logarithmic graph, so as you go up the graph, we're multiplying by powers of 10, not adding, so a straight line is exponential growth. Every level on this graph is a thousand times greater than the level below it. So this represents trillions fold increase over the last hundred years. Of what? Well, in this case, it's bits being moved around wirelessly. A hundred years ago, that was Morse code over AM radio. Today, it's 4G networks, but it's remarkable how smooth a progression that is. So here's the first graph I had, but I had it through 1980, and I had it in 81, and I, and I continued the curve, and we've stayed remarkably right on that curve. Uh, it is remarkable how continuous this has been. One, one of the objections in Paul Allen's article is exponential growth continues until it doesn't. Well, it's, that's true depending on what it is you're measuring. If you were measuring the, the uh, power of vacuum tubes, uh, the price performance of vacuum tubes, that continued exponentially. Every year they were shrinking the size of vacuum tubes, making them smaller and smaller. And that continued and continued until it hit a wall. And it stopped. So if you were looking at just that one paradigm, uh, it continued until it didn't. Uh, but what happened is it created research pressure to create the next paradigm, and transistors came along, and they're not small tubes. It's a whole different approach, and continued this. Each stripe here, I don't know if you can see them, are different technologies. Moore's law was not the first, but the fifth paradigm to bring exponential growth to computing. And it's been a smooth transition through five different paradigms. 
Now, so one of the objections to the singularity is Moore's law is going to come to an end. Uh, Gordon Moore has been one of the more conservative voices on this, said, well, 2002, that came and went. Uh, Intel now says 2022, I actually go along with that. At that time, key features will be four nanometers. It's about the width of 20 carbon atoms. Uh, around that time, we won't be able to shrink them anymore. And this fifth paradigm of flat integrated circuits will come to an end. We'll go to the sixth paradigm, which is three-dimensional computing, and we've already started in that direction. 30% of memory chips are already uh, three-dimensional. And, and that will continue this for a long time. Now, how now, that'll come to an end. I analyze that in singularities in here. What is the potential of the sixth paradigm? Uh, there are arguments for what the seventh paradigm might be, but you don't even have to go there because the ultimate computing of the sixth paradigm, basically computing in three dimensions at the molecular level, would give you a two-pound computer that's trillions of times more powerful than the human brain. Uh, and Paul, and Al Paul and Allen actually acknowledges uh, that analysis of the amount of computation you need to simulate either functionally or biologically a human brain, and that we are approaching that now with supercomputers, uh, that'll be a in the a that'll be a thousand dollars in the early 2020s. Uh, so, this curve, I mean, look at how remarkably predictable that is. I think that's a very powerful uh, message. It's gone through thick and thin, war and peace, boom times and recessions. It went through the Great Depression, two world wars. Cold War, nothing had any effect on it. Uh, it's a remarkably predictable trajectory. So I, I won't dwell on these examples of electronics. Cost of a transistor, you could get one for a dollar in 1968. You can get billions today. The cost of a transistor cycles come down by half. Uh, every year that's a 50% deflation rate for electronics. Uh, turns out to be true of any type of information technology. Hey, you want to buy a million bytes of brain data or genetic sequencing? Uh, it, it'll cost you half of what it did a year ago, year after year. The Genome Project was a very good example of this exponential progression, because halfway through the project, the skeptics were saying, no, we're, we're stuck on these various issues. There's no way we can actually get to the next stage. Uh, we've spent now seven years on this 15-year project, and we only finished 1% of the genome. Uh, my view was, uh, that's right, we're almost done. Uh, One percent is, is only seven doublings from 100 percent, and it's been doubling every year and will continue, and that is exactly what happened. It was finished seven years later, and, and biology has continued to scale up exponentially, and we more than make up for that 50 percent deflation rate. We've had 18 percent growth in every form of information technology for the last uh, 50 years, despite the fact you can get twice as much of it each year uh, for the same price. So biotechnology, I've, I've alluded to that. We don't have time to get into the details of that. Of course, you could have whole conferences, and there are whole conferences on this issue. The exciting thing, though, is that biology and medicine health have become information technologies. This is now in the research stage, but these technologies are growing exponentially. They will be a million times more powerful in less than 20 years. Communications, this is not Moore's Law. These are different technologies, but they progress exponentially in the same way. Very democratizing. Here's that violin I talked about. It was actually printed out in a three-dimensional printer. Uh, and this is a very exciting emerging technology that ultimately will get into the nano range uh, within a couple of decades. Uh, Time Magazine had a cover story in, on the law of accelerating returns and wanted, we wanted to print that graph and they said, hey, cover this uh, computer that we actually talked about a few weeks ago. So I didn't actually know if it would be on the curve. I knew it wouldn't be above the curve because I've never seen that, but sometimes you have a special purpose computing where you th the money you spend is on some other features and so it's below the curve, but it's the last point on there and it's actually right on the curve. It's amazing how predictable a trajectory this has been. And this, again, hides the scale of progress. Every level on this graph is 100,000 times greater than the level below it. So this is trillions-fold increase in the amount of computation you get per dollar, a billion-fold just since I was a student. So I've alluded to 
some of uh, this issue. I'm writing a book called How the Mind Works and How to Build One, as I mentioned. Uh, and we are making exponential gains at every level. We're turning that data into working models and simulations. Uh, I, I mentioned that I had a debate with John Horgan, and he had written this article that you need trillions of lines of code, and printed. And in his article was this picture saying, this is just a small slice of the cerebral cortex. Look at how complicated it is. We could never hope to understand this level of complexity. So I actually looked up this picture before the debate and turns out not to be a picture of the cerebral cortex at all. It's a picture of a computer simulation of the neocortex. <laughs> now, some audiences don't laugh at that because they don't <laughs> understand the implication. Uh, but clearly, if it's a simulation, we understand uh, the complexity of it because we created it. And many regions of the brain have been simulated. These are scaling up exponentially. Uh, the, 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 the proper approach, I mean, all of the different, there's many different approaches to understanding the brain, and they're all valid because they give us insights. But the real goal is to understand the principles of operation. Then we can apply those principles of operation to uh, our engineering principles to scale them up and leverage them. Consider how this subtle observation of Bernoulli's principle has been scaled up. We, we understand that there's slightly less air pressure over a moving curved surface than a flat surface. That's a scientific observation. So engineering came in, technology, and leveraged that and created the whole uh, world of, uh, of aviation. Similarly, as we understand the basic principles of, in, of human intelligence, we'll be able to scale them up and leverage them. We won't be limited to just a billion panel recognizers in the neocortex. We won't be limited to maybe a dozen levels uh, of hierarchy in the uh, conceptual hierarchy. Uh, we'll be able to go vastly beyond that and increase our thinking, and that's ultimately where we're headed, and that's the foundation of the singularity. So uh, I, I want to leave some time for questions, so I'm going to just deal with one unrelated question, which is, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And I, it never ceases to amaze me how there's a very powerful view that things are getting worse in the world. And the, w the problems are worse than they've ever been, and we're headed for disaster. We're going to run out of energy, uh, resources, uh, human conflict is growing. And I think at, th at the source of the problem is we are doing a much better job of understanding what's wrong with the world. When there's a battle in Fallujah or there's some kid who's sick in Ethiopia, we're there. It's right on in our faces. Uh, we and we have human empathy, so we, uh, we see these problems. We want to do something about it. It's actually a good thing because we actually do end up doing something about it. Uh, very often we can't immediately, so we feel badly about it. People have a naive algorithm for assessing how the world's doing uh, based on how, m how often do they hear about problems versus how often do they hear about things that are going well. And they hear about lots of problems, so they assume there are more problems. It's not like these problems didn't exist. Read Thomas Hobbes or Charles Dickens about how short, brutish, disaster-prone, disease-filled, poverty-filled, human life was two or three hundred years ago. But let's see how things went over 200 years, over the last 200 years, at least on uh, two parameters, wealth of nations, which is on the x-axis on a logarithmic scale, and life expectancy on a linear scale on the, on the y-axis. Those are countries. The big red circle is China. You might keep an eye out for China because it does some funny things. Um, Income per person in today's dollars was hundreds of dollars per year in 1800. Life expectancy was in the 20s and 30s, depending on where you lived. Average was 37. And not much happened in the early 19th century. The Industrial Revolution was getting started. Some countries were making progress because they're the only ones participating. But as we get to the 20th century, in summary, you'll see a wind moving all of these countries towards the upper right-hand corner of the graph. There's a have-have-not divide that does not go away. Uh, nonetheless, every country is affected, and the countries that are worst off at the end of this process 
uh, are far better off than the best countries uh, at the beginning of this process. And this is actually picking up speed as more of the underlying phenomena become information technologies and they're subject to exponential growth. Uh, education, we are spending more on education. Uh, 10 times as much in constant dollars in K through 12 per capita. Uh, we had 50,000 college students in 1870 in the United States. We have over 10 million today. The average number of years of schooling, uh, there's a have, have not divide, but uh, the developed world and the developing world are both moving in the right direction. We've tripled the average number of years of schooling in the developing world, doubled it in the developed world over the last 50 years. So I'll leave it at that so we have time for some questions. Uh, I will say that the law of accelerating returns is alive and well. Uh, all the graphs have in singularities near. We update annually. Uh, and uh, they're all continuing to track. And if you measure the underlying, the fundamental underlying properties of information technology, they progress exponentially. There's a strong theoretical reason for it. The empirical evidence, though, is the most impressive, and it uh, is not affected by the kinds of events that you might think about. People say, well, it must have slowed down during the recent recession. Not at all. Uh, it's quite remarkable how it's unaffected by world events, and that is the engine that gets us to a future world that will be transformed. I mean, just look at how different things are today than they were a few years ago. We'd, a few years ago, we didn't use social networks, wikis, or blogs. A dozen years ago, most people didn't use search engines. That really sounds like ancient history. Uh, there's going to be far more change. The fact the world's going to be, you know, if you look at the accumulated result of exponential change over a few decades, uh, the results and the conclusions are quite remarkable. That is the essence of the singularity. Now, exactly what that means, is it good or bad? There's definitely both promise and peril. Uh, I think it's important for people to understand that. This issue, because it is only these exponentially growing information technologies that will have the scale to address the major challenges of humanity. And on the flip side, they introduce new dangers. There are answers to that as well, but we need to put a high social priority on keeping these technologies constructive. And lots of issues come up, privacy, protection of intellectual property, and uh, I, don't, I wouldn't present pat answers to any of those. These are proper uh, issues to debate by groups like this one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. We've got about 10 minutes for questions, and we've got two or maybe even three folks running with mics. So raise your hand. They will come to you, and please keep it quick. Uh, Ray, David Bryn here. I just uh, I think it's an absolutely terrific talk, and we're all very excited to be here. It's going to be a great weekend. I just wanted to ask you, though, you seem to go very quickly by the notion that perhaps the calculations of the number of synapses may not be the goal point. That there's a lot more talk now about intracellular com computation perhaps taking place uh, on the scale of, of four or five orders of magnitude inside neurons and uh, possibly in the accompanying astrocytes and glial cells. Does this change your goalpost? Yeah, I mean, Hameroff talks about cellular computing in the tubules. I don't think there's any evidence uh, that that, ha that there is such a thing and that it has an information bearing. Uh, I think there's some very good uh, concepts of what the different modules in the neocortex, which is the most important region, including its supporting mechanisms of the hippocampus, which recognizes new information and then formats them so we can learn them and sends them back to the neocortex <coughs> to be assigned. Uh, the important thing is what do these modules do uh, and not necessarily what the mechanisms are. Uh, but ultimately, I think it is important to understand the mechanisms to verify that these models are correct. Um, there's, biology does not always take the most direct route. It does things fairly inefficiently. Uh, but th there's really no evidence uh, of some of these theories of uh, 
cellular computing in, in the tubules and so on. Uh, if it were true, delay our ability to biologically simulate the brain by 10 or 20 years. Um, so it wouldn't radically change things. I don't think biological simulation in any event is the way to go. As I mentioned, I think we try to do biological simulation to verify that our functional simulations are correct. But I'm skeptical of, of those particular theories. Um, I know you go to great extent in here. I go, know you, you go to great extent in, in your book describing the mechanisms and the technology uh, behind reverse engineering the brain. Uh, and after reading uh, Paul Allen's uh, uh, article uh, uh, trying to re re rebutting the, the idea that uh, that complexity can be achieved in the time frame that you express, uh, my, my question is do you really? Uh, believe that uh, accomplishing uh, intelligence equal or superior to uh, the human brain requires a full understanding, a reverse engineering of the human brain as a result of the uh, evolutionary machine, or can we achieve uh, the same result through a different mechanism that doesn't necessarily uh, mimic the effects of evolution? Well, it's a good question, and. Uh Paul Allen's article assumes that we do. Uh, I think the answer is no. We've made very good progress in AI uh, with no understanding of the human brain because it's only recently that we have the tools to actually see the brain with, a, with sufficient resolution. M fMRI can show you that I'm looking at it, and I actually had one while I was doing things. So you look at a picture of a loved one and one area lights up and you solve a logic puzzle and another area lights up and uh, gives you some idea of what's happening where, but obviously not enough to understand the algorithms. We have now scanning methods in the living brain that can see our brain create our thoughts at the level of individual connections. It can see our thoughts create our brain because we can see new synapses and connections and new dendrites uh, actually form. Uh, but no, I, d I don't think we have to. We, we can, we've achieved a lot in AI without it. Uh, I think it's an opportunity to get these biologically inspired mechanisms. We can learn a lot about the brain. As we understand these basic principles, we can then apply them with our engineering uh, insights. The emerging theories about how these modules in the neocortex work and how they wired together, uh, we can then create a system that's not limited by the fact that we can only fit a billion uh, modules in this table napkin sized neocortex. The big innovation in human beings is we have this big forehead that could squeeze in more of a neocortex, but we, do, we don't have that limitation. Uh, and we can create systems that are ultimately far more powerful. Uh, so I think it's, it's a great opportunity. There are other reasons to do it as well, so we can start fixing the brain based on an understanding of it as a network and not a chemical soup. Uh, most importantly, it'll give us insight into ourselves. That's been the goal of the arts and sciences ever since we had art and science uh, to understand who we are. Uh, I've actually gotten more insight into my own thinking as I think about my own thinking in light of what we know about the neocortex and it ex explains a lot actually. Um, so <laughs> why we forget things, why we don't remember very much, we actually have very little capacity in our brains. So I think it's an opportunity to get these biologically inspired paradigms. It would take us longer if we didn't do it. Dwight Worth Palmeyer, Widener University. Um, the way we frame things uh, can, can scare people. And, I, and I've seen talk of, after the singularity, the, the post-human era, or it's the, it's the computer era and, and the humans are sort of second place at that point. Um, is that an accurate assessment, or, or is this become just a tool for humanity? Well, it, it brings up the issue of the terminology we use. I actually don't like any of it. Artificial intelligence implies that intelligence is, AI is not real intelligence. Virtual reality implies that it's not real reality. The telephone is virtual reality. You can be together in this virtual space as far as talking is concerned. Um, so I could tell you, oh, that agreement I made with you last night, that was in virtual reality, that's not real. <laughs> that, that, that loving sentiment I told you, that was virtual. 
Um, and then the term post-human or transhumanism. I mean, we're stuck with these terms, but it implies we're going to transcend our humanity. In my view, uh, what humanity is all about is, in fact, going beyond our biological limitations. We didn't stay on the ground. We didn't stay on the planet. We have not stayed with the limitations of our biology, which was the life expectancy of early 20s, a thousand years ago. Uh, we change who we are. Uh, this computer is part of me, even though it's not inside me. I'd actually l wish that it were, because I'd stop losing it. Uh, <laughs> but it's definitely part of who we are. We create these tools to make ourselves greater. We're the only species that does that. So I think we're headed for a trans-biological future. We're going to transcend the limitations of biology. We've done that already to some extent, but it's going to progress in an exponential manner. But, you know, merging with machines, these machines are, we're only going to do that as they enhance ourselves and overcome medical problems and limitations in our thinking. We've done that already. I was just at a music conference and these musicians are using these incredibly sophisticated tools to create music. That's why we create them. So we're going to continue to transcend. We are going to, uh, the, bi the non-biological portion of the intelligence of our civilization is going to grow exponentially and become a larger fraction of the whole. Uh, but it's still the human civilization, which is already a human machine civilization. We've got time for just one more very quick question. Rad Achudan, Long Island University. I am very optimistic after hearing all that you have said, but there are certain areas which give me problems still. One is uh, we have modulated our intelligence and our world through natural language but, and tried to solve many problems, made some progress, but one is poverty. There is global poverty, 40% of the people live on very small amounts of money and die very frequently, like 30,000 a day due to poverty. Will a friendly artificial intelligence be able to uh, modulate our approach to the resolution of this problem since we have had so much difficulty with it? Okay, I, I couldn't hear some of the words you were saying. So. Would, would a friendly artificial intelligence in, that is, that'll come in the future be able to help us with the resolution of the issue of poverty through our global political economy. We seem to invent all kinds of arguments as to why we should keep it in place. Okay, well you brought up a couple of concepts. Friendly AI, that was coined by Eliezer Yatkowski, who I think is here. Um, and are we improving our overall global political social wisdom either to keep up uh, with the growing technology or uh, at le or to t at least to take advantage of it. Um, friendly AI pertains to this promise versus peril issue that I alluded to quickly. That would bear a longer discussion than I can give in a minute. Uh, but I think it's actually a very important issue. At Singularity University, we th the university was founded to both address the, the promise side to try to apply these exponential growing information technologies to address major challenges like poverty and water availability and so on, and also to deal with these uh, existential risks that are emerging. Uh, biotechnology is a much nearer term one. Uh, today, uh, you know, a biologist uh, with a uh, unsociable uh, purpose could create a biological virus that was deadly or communicable or create a new bioweapon. Uh, there are things we can do about it. We need a rapid response system that can detect that and deactivate it, much like we have for software viruses. I mean, it's a very quick answer. It's not a pat issue, but I do think we can deal with it. But in terms of your question, which is a very good one, is can we keep up with this? Do we have the wisdom? Uh, we see examples of this sort of decentralized communication we have doing both increasing our wisdom and decreasing it. You can certainly see lynch mob behavior uh, on the internet. It's not hard to come up with examples and there's a whole slew of books now that, that cite these examples. Uh, my view is that the wisdom of crowds 
is actually more powerful phenomena. I wrote in the 1980s in my first book, The Age of Intelligent Machines, that the Soviet Union, which was then going strong, would be swept away by the then emerging decentralized technology, which was early forms of email over teletype machines and fax machines, and people thought that was nuts, that the mighty Soviet Union would be swept away by a few teletype machines, but that is exactly what happened. And we can see the power today of social networks of, and the power of people having information and knowledge. It's no longer centrally controlled. Uh, virtually everyone in the world has access to this very powerful information. Uh, a kid in Africa with a smartphone has access to more information than the President of the United States did 15 years ago. I used that line at, at Google Zeitgeist uh, last week and then saw that Chelsea Clinton was in the audience and I said, uh, the President was your father then. And, uh, and I said, he did a good job anyway and I'm sure he has a smartphone today. Uh, but it's this very, very empowering technology. And it's not just political democracy. It, it, it enables innovation. So a kid in college who wanted a better way to meet girls can create a revolution, created Facebook. Another couple of kids in a, in a late night dorm room challenge created Google. We're going to see teenage kids doing this. In fact, there's a, a teenage girl who's a blogger. I think she's 15. That is now the sort of power of the fashion industry with her blog, when she, start, when she started at 11. I mean, kids are becoming very powerful because the individual is empowered by these technologies. And it does lead to the wisdom of crowds. And so it is changing, even though we don't have, are slow to change the rules, are already you can see the profound impact of the blogosphere and the uh, tweetosphere and all of the different online communication methods we have, Facebook, uh, on opinion formation and affects politics, it affects medicine. A, a woman walks into her doctor's office with a chronic disease, she's in touch with her peers around the world and, and probably knows more about that disease or may very well than her doctor. Uh, and patient groups are actually getting together and doing collaborative problem solving and they're motivated to, s to solve that problem of that disease. Uh, I think that's a much more powerful phenomenon than the lynch mob behavior you, you see, but at every level, we will see promise versus peril. Uh, but I think the whole move towards democracy, if you look over the last thousand years, uh, has been empowered by the greater distribution of information, you know, starting with Gutenberg's invention and then the telephone and then with the very powerful technologies we have today. It has empowered the individual and the collaborative. That's not the fourth collectivism that failed under communism, but the sort of self-organizing, uh, collective problem-solving uh, that rep that's represented by the wisdom of crowds. Thank you very much. Thank you.